Hi, my name is Chris Morano, and I'm a geriatric psychiatrist at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Today, I'll be sp briefly speaking about the history of Alzheimer's disease, as well as our current understanding of the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. Any discussion of Alzheimer's disease must first begin, of course, with Dr. Aloe Alzheimer, as well as the first patient he described with what we now know as Alzheimer's disease, August D. In 1906, Dr. Alzheimer's discovered changes in the brain of a woman who died from what was felt to be at the time an unusual mental illness. Her symptoms included loss of memory, difficulties with language, and unpredictable behavior, including symptoms of psychosis. After her death, Dr. Alzheimer examined her brain and found many abnormal clumps, which we now know as amyloid plaques, as well as tangled bum bundles of fibers, which we now know as neurofibrillary tangles. Interestingly, Alzheimer's disease was felt to be an unusual cause of dementia, uh, which occurred predominantly in younger people. Our understanding changed in the 1960s and 70s. We now recognize Alzheimer's disease as the most common cause of dementia. Here we see the pathologic hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. On the left, we see healthy brain tissue. On the right, we see a picture of the brain affected by Alzheimer's disease. Outside of the cell, we see amyloid plaques. These are accumulations of an abnormal protein fragment called beta amyloid. Inside the cells, we see neurofibrillary tangles. These are accumulations of a protein called hyperphosphorylated tau. Plaques and tangles are the two main pathologic features of Alzheimer's disease. Initially, we were able to only see plaques and tangles on autopsy of the brain. Plaques and tangles um, are followed by the progressive loss of connections between neurons as well as the death of neurons, which ultimately results in atrophy of the brain. The damage from Alzheimer's begins 10 to 20 years prior to the development of clinical symptoms. Here we can see the difference between a healthy brain and a, the brain of an individual with severe Alzheimer's disease. Most notably in the brain of a patient with severe Alzheimer's disease, we see atrophy. And this atrophy occurs throughout the brain. Throughout the ensuing decades, we've learned a lot more about the pathophysiology of, of Alzheimer's disease. We know that age is the number one risk factor for the development of Alzheimer's. We also know that cardiovascular risk factors, such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and obesity, increase someone's risk of developing Alzheimer's later in life. Our best understanding of how Alzheimer's develop, develops uh, in the brain is called the amyloid cascade hypothesis. And with improvements in technology, we are now able to visualize many of the changes of Alzheimer's in the living person. According to the amyloid cascade hypothesis, the first changes that develop in Alzheimer's disease is the accumulation of beta amyloid. At this point in time, the patient with Alzheimer's would have no symptoms. The second development that occurs is the accumulation of hyperphosphorylated tau. We can see beta amyloid in the living brain using PET scans today. We can also see uh, the changes in of beta amyloid and hyperphosphorylated tau in cerebrospinal fluid today. 
still at this point, as tau accumulates in the early stages, a patient may have no clinical symptoms. The next phase proposed by the amyloid cascade hypothesis it are changes in brain structure. At this point in time, connections between brain neurons are lost and neurons will die. Therefore, the, we can see atrophy on the brain in various neuroimaging techniques such as MRI and CAT scan. Initially, these, this atrophy may be very subtle and only may be seen in certain memory areas of the brain. But as the disease progresses, the atrophy spreads throughout the brain. The next stage seen in Alzheimer's is the development of clinical symptoms. These first symptoms are generally changes in memory, but can sometimes include changes in other areas of thinking. We call this phase of the illness mild cognitive impairment because at this point in time, though there may be uh, memory difficulties present, the individual with Alzheimer's disease is still functioning at a normal level in day-to-day -day life. As the changes of Alzheimer's proceed, more neurons die, the patient with Alzheimer's will develop the dementia syndrome. At this point in time, the changes in memory and other areas of thinking are accompanied by changes in day-to-day -day functioning, and thus the individual would meet the criteria for Alzheimer's type dementia. Thank you very much for your time in our conversation today about a brief history of Alzheimer's disease and our current understanding of its pathophysiology.